Amen. All right, check this out. How many of you guys like uh, the 20 questions, those kind of games, right? See if you can guess what event this is, all right? Until the 1990s, no trial in American history attracted more attention than this one, okay? It was... Hey, listen, I got to at least finish it before you guess, all right? It was held in 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee, and it accused a teacher of violating a state law that banned the teaching on evolution back in that day. And although the teacher had not taught biology, and he couldn't even remember for sure if he'd even discussed evolution as he was substituting for the regular teacher, so he was just a substitute, he agreed to, quote, be arrested, so that's, it was a setup, and go to trial anyway, okay? Well, for the contest, the ACLU brought in several big city attorneys, including the famed criminal lawyer, the atheist Clarence Darrow from Chicago, okay? And to assist in the prosecution, the World's Christian Fundamentalist Association secured the services of William Jennings Bryan uh, from Nebraska. He actually was a three times candidate for the president of the US, okay, Christian. Okay, and it was until this trial that most of our schools here in America taught divine creation. Uh, students learned back in those days, believe it or not, they studied the facts of science and were told that the evidence indicates there is a creator who designed the universe and the plants and the animals. That's how it used to be here. But that was the change, okay? The trial lasted eight days, and as expected, it ended up in a conviction for the young teacher whose own attorneys admitted his own guilt. So they lost. Okay, but here's the whole point. In this famous trial, the atheist lawyer, Clarence Darrow, made this statement. Listen to this. He said, it is, it, here was his whole attack, if you will. They had no substance. They lost the case anyway, whatever. Here was his whole thing that he kept bringing up. He said, quote, it is bigotry. It is bigotry to teach only one view of origin. He said, quote, students should be taught both creation and evolution in schools. And so in 35 years following that trial, the theory of evolution was not only taught more and more, but it was beginning to be presented as if it were a proven fact, and it's not until today. Listen, we actually have this trial in complete reverse. Evolution now is the only theory that is taught in school, okay? Hypocrisy, okay? And once again, for those of you who please act like you didn't guess it the first 19 nanoseconds when it started, that would be what trial? Scopes monkey trial, okay? So most of you, it sounds like, has heard of that trial, okay? But here's my point. What most of us don't realize about that trial is that even though those guys lost the course, okay, after that trial, it seemed to start to change the direction of the course of our nation. Uh, certainly in our education system, and then as we're going to see in a little bit, it did have an effect on the course of our nation, okay? They lost the case, but at that point, it seemed to be a watershed moment. Evolutionary teachings start, it kind of made a foothold and started to gain, gain some momentum, uh, in our country, okay? Over the next 35 years from that trial, the theory of evolution began to be taught more and more up until about the 1960s. And at that point, we had prayer taken out of our schools. Yes, it used to be a part of our education. Some of you guys remember that. Uh, used to have, they took out Bible study in schools. Yes, that used to be a part. As we saw before in other studies, that's how we used to learn the alphabet for over 200 years of our country's education. For instance, like this, kids would learn the alphabet. A, in Adam's fall, we send all. And go right down the list. It was all linked with biblical verses, okay? So, but in the 60s, they took out prayer, they took out Bible reading in their school, and evolution was put in. Now, the problem with this is, folks, it's not just a, a theory, it is absolutely disastrous. The effects of taking the Bible and prayer out of our school system has had horrible results for our country okay, and putting evolution in. And what I'm gonna share with you is the actual U.S. Census Bureau behavioral statistics, specifically from 1963 on, and you tell me if the introduction of evolution and the removal of God from our school has had a good effect on our country. I don't think so, let's take a look. Back in the 1950s, the average textbook only had two to 3,000 words about evolution. But in 1963, it jumped up to 33,000 words. It started to spike, and it's gone nuts ever since. Now, it just so happened that in 1963 is also when prayer and Bible reading was taken out of the American school system. And so let's take a look at what effect this has had on our country. Is it purely by chance? I don't think so. Since 1963, sexually transmitted diseases among teenagers and young adults have increased 400%. These are the actual charts. Anybody notice a serious increase? 
gone skyrocketed. Cases of premarital sex among teenagers have absolutely skyrocketed as well. Unwed pregnancies among young girls are up 553% since then. Unmed, uh, unmarried couples living together are up 725%, okay? And it's even affecting the church. Divorce rates since then have uh, uh, rose to 111% since the introduction there. Single parent households are quickly becoming the norm. And SAT scores have absolutely plum, uh, plummeted. We are being dumbed down okay, in our educational system. Alcohol and uh, drug abuse have, have gone absolutely uh, ballistic, as we all know. And listen to this. Violent crime, since the introduction of that, has gone up 995%. Since you took God out of the school and you put evolution in, okay? I mean, if you want to think of it as true and you got to deal with the facts, but it's not as we've been seeing. It's a lie. And we're going to get to that again tonight. So why would that happen? Why would it have such a drastic result uh, on people's behavior when you take God out of the equation and you put the evolution in? Well, it's simple as we saw before. If you tell kids they came from an ape, why are you surprised when they act like an ape? If you tell people there is no God, why are you surprised when they act ungodly? If you tell kids there is no reason, there is no value, there is no purpose to life, then why are we shocked when they're so flippant to take a life? Over a pair of shoes, I'll shoot you in the head. What you believe determines how you behave. And if you take God out of the equation, this is what you get. Evolution is detrimental uh, to our country and has been. And how many decades now have we been... Uh, that lie being pushed upon us and how long has the behavior in our country gone down the tubes it's a direct result and that's why we're going to continue our study taking a look at the witness of god's creation okay and again the premise is what we're doing is we're taking a look at different evidences that god's left behind for us in his creation to show us he's not just real but the good news is we can really have a personal relationship with him through jesus christ anybody excited about that yeah, just a little bit, okay? And we've already seen that first evidence he's left behind for us, showing us this amazing truth, was the evidence of an intelligent creation. We dealt with 10 weeks of the evidence of intelligent design. Now, the uh, last six times, we saw the evidence of a young creation. We have not been here for millions and billions of years. That's another lie. And that lie actually calls Jesus Christ a liar. Because if you add up the dates in the Bible, Jesus said the beginning point was Adam and Eve. You add up the dates, you get about 6,000 years. How many guys would say it's probably not a good thing to call Jesus Christ a liar? Okay, but it's even worse than that. We saw for six weeks, they call, they call God the Father liar and even God's word a liar. We have not been here for millions and billions of years, roughly about 6,000 years like the Bible supposes. And so we just stopped right there. No, we used our brain that God gave us, the reason that he gave us, the logic he gave us, come let us reason together, the prophet says, and we took a look at the facts, and we saw that it is a lie. This millions and billions of years things is a lie, and we exposed that with the evidence of space, the evidence of earth, and logic. We looked at all their dating methods, carbon dating, radiometric dating, the geological bunch of baloney, okay, to put it kindly. <laughs> it's a lie. And then last time, if you were here, we saw rapid formation, absolutely proves that okay it's almost like you know based on the scientific evidence if you were here last time that uh it agrees with the biblical account when god spoke and created the earth all of a sudden it firmed up just like that polonium halos remember that isn't that wild it's exactly the biblical account it didn't take millions and millions of years as evolution would say okay but that's all the third evidence that god's left behind for us showing us this absolutely amazing proof that he is real we can have a relationship with him through jesus christ is the evidence of a special creation and this is something i've really been looking forward to get at and this is kind of what we talked about here in just the opening part uh, with the behavioral statistics okay have you ever wondered why our world is so absolutely hopeless so down in the mouth, the kids growing up today just, right? I mean, I mean, think about the message that our society is telling them from we high. I mean, here, here's the great thing that really charges them to get out of bed. Hey, everybody, according to evolution, you are nothing, you came from nothing, and you're going nowhere. Woo, yeah. Now go be a productive citizen. Isn't that the message that they're being taught? From we high, that's all they know. You are nothing. You have no purpose, no value. When you die, you just go back to the ground to be worm bait. Now contrast that to what the scripture says. The Bible says you are special, unlike any other of God's creation. And you were created for a special purpose in the image of a special God. That's what God says. Let's take a look at that and remind ourselves of that great news. Genesis chapter 1, 
It's what the scripture says, Genesis chapter 1. Let's take a look there. If you find the preface, what do you do? Go to the right. That's right. And uh, most likely it's on page one of your Bible, unless you have the large print Bible. And then it could be on, well, it all depends on the font, doesn't it? But anyway, that's right. Genesis chapter one. We're going to read verses 24 through 28. How did we get here? Is it really hopeless? There's no reason. There's no direction. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, Let's take a look at what God tells us. All right. Uh, Genesis chapter one, verse 24. When you get there, say moo. Ooh, that's a good one. All right. There's a demon in the house. I heard that. Spiritual warfare. I better switch my message up. No, let's continue on. Uh, Verse 24, and God said, who said this? God, let the lamb produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds. And how many of the creatures? All the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, Hey, let us, well, hey, wait a second, who's us? A little side note here. That's the Trinity right there in Genesis chapter 1. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's Elohim, it's plural in the Hebrew there. Let us, uh, the Trinity, make man in our what? Image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. Boy, that's another lie of the evolution and the, the environmental movement. Who's ruling man now? You know, because in case you have that, uh, that spotted owl on your property bird or that uh, uh, Swahili and uh, catfish suckerfish uh, in your pond. You can't develop it. You lose your land. You know what I'm saying? Complete opposite. But anyway, we're supposed to rule over, what's it say there? Over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So who created man? God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Okay? So the Bible clearly tells us that God, after he made the animals, who did he decide to go ahead and make? Mankind. He made you and I, okay? But not only that, what did he say? He drew a distinction. We are a special creation, unlike the animals, unlike the plants, okay? Mankind is radically different. He said that he made us specifically in his image, right? Now, again, these uh, evolution, creation, the Bible, man's so-called wisdom are at war with each other. What does evolution teach? Do they say, oh yeah, here's the great news. This is why you have purpose and value in your life. God is the one who created us in his special image, and so you got a special purpose. Life is good. No, they say you came from an uh, image of an ape, and you're purely an accident, right? Complete polar opposites. Now, and not only that, listen to this. You talk about twisting, once again, the biblical account. Evolution does not say that God created us after the animals. We just read that, right? Evolution says we came from the animals. Talk about an offense to God, okay? And what they do is they say, well, and we have proof of this. That's right. It's not just a theory. Ruth, that's right. We have proof of this because we have so many evidences of the missing link. We've got this evidence from man changing from a monkey into Joey, okay? It's like there. <laughs> You're right there, bro. I had to use it. Yeah, so that's what you get for the millions of years. No. Uh, but <laughs> right? And so I would say, let's take a look at these supposed eight man uh, links and see who's telling the truth, okay? And, uh, but before we do that, we just read the biblical account of how man got here, right? Okay? As goofy as what I'm about to show you, This is actually how evolution says we got here, ultimately, eventually from an ape, but it started earlier than that. This is actually what's taught in school. Now, keep in mind, this is the little crumb snatchers, okay, taught in school from wee high. This is what's drilled in their head, not what we just read, page one of the Bible, good news, you got value. You're a special creation, created for a special purpose by a special God. This is what they're taught. Okay, let's take a look at evolution's version of man. In the beginning, they say, and this is from a textbook, about four billion years ago. Really? How do you know? Were you there? No. Okay, but anyway, we dealt six weeks with that lie. Uh, The air was unfit to breathe, kind of like L.A., if you've been down there, you know, down, (laughs) right, or whatever, apparently. Uh, The the earth was uh, without life, and the sun beat down, and storms lashed the coast, and volcanoes poured hissing lava into the ocean's waters. Let's get into that. Let's all hiss. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? 
Yeah, whatever. Let's move on. But it was these natural jolts that fused simple molecules into more complex ones. Uh, amino acids started to form and then interact with each other, and soon primitive proteins were fashioned, and perhaps, Joey, as a worm-like molecule. You know, we don't know. We just keyword there, perhaps. You know, uh, uh, and then somehow the, the right molecules uh, got together and the first living cell appeared. The first living cell is the, the, the great ancestor of all plants and animals on earth, including who? Man. So according to evolution, this is grandpa right there. And he's trying to get it all figured out. All right, and that's what they're doing. Okay, but let's move on. Now, they say, it's, no, they didn't stop there. From this first cell, all other forms of life evolved and, and, and is actually, this is their words, the father of us all. How did man come from this uh, first cell? I love this, Tom. Here's the story. Of, uh, it sounds just like that, doesn't it? It's like, come on, man, story. Okay, here it is. As time went on, this first cell developed into an amoeba-like or organism that could survive in the ocean. That comes in handy. Okay, and after millions of years, these creatures evolved into a fish. As you can see, the prophet Gary Larson has solved the dilemma. Why would they even do that? Well, because they were playing baseball, as you can see there, the ball got knocked up on the land, so they had to evolve legs, Tom, to get the baseball because it was only the third inning and they... Hey, if you're going to make up a story, I'm going to make up one too, okay? Uh, but that's what it says, okay? Now, now, then they say, well, and some of these fish develop lungs so that they could survive outside the water. Now, we saw before that's absolutely ludicrous because even if that were true and it's not, uh, you couldn't survive because at some point, the halfway point, logically, you would have lungs that are only halfway evolved for the water and halfway for the air, which means you can't breathe the water no more and you can't breathe air, so you're dead. And how many guys would say that dead fish have no babies? Right, it's ridiculous. But anyway, but that's what they got. So they supposedly developed these lungs, right? And then gradually began to make their way onto land as the first amphibians, okay, is what they say. And it was these amphibians that evolved into reptiles. And the earth became populated with great dinosaurs, they say. And some of these reptiles developed legs and, and became what we call today mammals. That's right. And, and, but other reptiles developed wings and flew away to become the birds. So where did man come from? Hey, thanks for asking, Mario. I want to know too, according to their story. Well, I'm not making this up. This is taught in the textbooks. That's a picture of one. One of the early mammals was known as a tree shrew and was not much larger than a squirrel. And it looked like a squirrel. Grandpa? Was your great, 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 great grandpa a squirrel riding skis and being patriotic during the July 4th? And we came from a squirrel? That's nuts, okay? It gets even worse. And it was this creature that lived in the trees and gradually evolved into primitive monkeys and other ape-like creatures. And it was from these ape-like creatures. Go ahead, Joey, wave at it. I know you want to. There you go. Yeah. Uh, ape-like creatures evolved to the great apes that we see in zoos today. Well, wait a second. If we got the apes in zoos today and we suppose he came from the apes, how can we don't see him giving birth to other humans? Why are they still apes? Well, hey, well, you're not supposed to answer that. Uh, as well as the creature who came down from the trees and starting uh, walking upright. That's right, folks. This is man. Right there. Now, let's be honest. I grew up in the Midwest. How many of you guys got relatives that actually look like that? But you don't want <laughs> Guests come over to your house. You hide the pictures real quick under the couch. Okay, I know you're out there. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, in fact, the, this is actually taught in textbooks. Right? This is what kids are being taught. In fact, our, quote, father, that first living cell, would have been very proud of us if he could see how far we've come over all these years. Now, Tom, that's our, supposedly our father there. I, I, I mean, can anybody find a smile? Me personally, I'm still debating Joe. Now, is his eyes down here or is that his eye over there? That one got hit with the baseball bat from the fish trying to evolve and his nose got ran over by a truck. Doing a, is it a cartwheel? Is that what's going on there? Okay. Okay, but the point is this, okay, I wanted to give you a refresher of that because especially those who've been out of the school system, secular for a while, but folks, that's really what's taught. And how many guys would say that's just a little bit different than what we just read in the Genesis account? Okay, it, incredibly different, okay? And that's what they say. They say that we don't have a special creation, a special purpose, no value in life, unlike what the scripture says. They actually would teach kids from wee high that you came from a supposed simple cell to a blob of gel to an ape that smells. And we wonder why our world is so hopeless, okay? But is this true? I mean, it's one thing for you to put the caricatures in the textbook and you just boldly proclaim it as if you know for sure this happened, but did we really come 
not only from the cell, but up to the ape and to you and I today. Is there any evidence that we really did come from an ape? No. In fact, folks, and I'll use this word. In fact, what we're going to see, Lord willing, over the next several weeks is we're going to look at lie after lie after all. I, I have no shame in using this word because it's a lie. We're going to look at all the supposed evidences of evolution and their lies. This blows me away. Even if you ignore all the evidence for intelligent design, even if you ignore what we studied the last six weeks for the, the Achilles heel of evolution, the millions and millions of years, even give them that, all the mechanisms they say, oh, we know for sure that we've evolved, every single one of them is a lie. And one of the biggest ones, I'm telling you folks, is this eight-man myth baloney. It's a lie. Let's take a look at their missing links, and you tell me if somebody's trying to make a monkey out of this. Okay, this is absolutely uh, crazy there. Well, except for maybe that one. Then maybe that's uh, accurate there, that picture. But let's move on. Uh, Nebraska man. Okay, this is one of their proofs. Okay, in 1922, scientists discovered a fossil that was reported to be one million years old. I know, it was amazing, wasn't it? And it was heralded in as the missing link uh, in human evolution. And it was called Nebraska man, Joey, because... You get a piece of gum for that, bro, right there. All right. It was found in the state of Nebraska, okay? Now, Henry Osborne, he was a paleontologist. He said, hey, this combined the characteristics of chimpanzees and man. This is amazing. And this fossil became famous because it was used as evidence in what? The Scopes Monkey Trial. So this was their evidence. Well, let's take a look at their evidence. For many years, evolutionists described Nebraska man as a missing link. That's right. But the only problem was it didn't belong to any type of human or an ape. Okay? It was actually found out to be just a mere tooth is all they found. And the tooth came from a pig. Not making it up. Check it out for yourself, folks. All they had was a tooth. The tooth was not even from man. It was from a pig. They built a whole imaginary, and this was evidence for the scope monkey trial. They built a whole imaginary society around a single pig tooth. Okay, here's a picture. They built the entire Nebraska man out of plaster of Paris and imagination. They even built him a wife. I like what one guy said. He said this, you got to be pretty good to know what he looks like, his wife, just from his tooth. <laughs> what? Nuts. Right? And this is your evidence? It's crazy. Okay, so based on the evidence, that's right, using our brains that God gave us, according to the evidence, um, here's the real Nebraska man right there. Right there, you know, you can cook him up, put him on some cow, and you'll be good to go. But that's the Nebraska man, folks. I'm telling you, it gets worse. And this is our proof that we evolved from apes. Absolutely ridiculous. Next one's Piltdown Man. Okay, uh, take a look at this one. For 50 years, we were led to believe that this ancient creature was a supposed ancestor of modern man. It was found in a gravel pit in uh, Sussex, England in 1912. And he was considered by some, Piltdown Man, to be some, uh, uh, the second most important fossil, proving, that's right, the evolution of man. But when two scientists eventually took a closer look, they found that Piltdown Man was what? Shocker, it was a fraud. Listen to what these guys did. The original discoverers took a human skull and an ape's jawbone filed them down, and made them fit together. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Then they treated them with acid to make them look old, and then they buried them in the gravel pit, and, oh, hey, look what we discovered. Kill down, man. Even science channels admit today that this thing was a complete lie. Let's take a look. Immediately it became plain that the staining on the bones was superficial. Uh, the artifacts had been stained. The material which had been cut was probably cut when it was already fossil using a steel knife. When the scientists looked at Piltdown Man's teeth under the microscope, they got another shock. There is some evidence for the fact that the teeth, in fact, had been filed down. There were sort of still scratch marks, deep scratch marks, obviously had been made by some implement that had been used to sort of uh, uh, bring these molars down to a particular desired shape. The jawbone dated back less than 100 years. It came from a female orangutan. Pieces were broken off which could have shown that these, the jawbone did not belong with the skull. So they removed the pieces that would have shown the bones did not match directly. This canine tooth was filed down and rubbed down to make it much smaller. In the front part of the jaw here, it's been broken off, which obviously 
takes away the telltale signs that it obviously is an ape and not a, quote, humanoid jaw. All the evidence pointed to only one conclusion. Somebody had forged the Piltdown fossils. Scientists were stunned. Who would do such a thing and why? Hmm. Well, when you have zero evidence for your so-called theory, you lie. You make it up. And you print it, because you got control of the printing, and you repeat the lie loud enough, long enough, and often enough, and people will believe it. That's not all, but listen to this, folks. It was such a lie for so long. Oh, by the way, that's from Discovery. Even they know it's a lie. So you can't say, oh, it's just you Christians. No, it's a lie. 500 people actually studied the Piltdown man's fossils back in the day when they said, oh, this is proof. And they wrote PhD dissertations on it, earned a doctorate degree, and it was all a lie. So they have to turn their doctorates back in? Okay, it was a lie. In fact, uh, for decades, one guy brings this point out. It's really good. He says, for decades, boys and girls went to school and were taught that Piltdown Man was proof of evolution. Solid proof. The whole time it was not. It was a lie. It was a hoax. And he says this, I wonder how many kids during those years lost confidence in the Bible and doubted Jesus because of this lie. What's Jesus say? You want to be a stumbling block to little kids? Hey, it's better you have a millstone. You know what a millstone is? Big, massive stone, round, circular thing with a hole in the center that they put a, a shaft through it, and that's what they rolled the grain with, okay? Even on my best day, eating serious amounts of cow, I couldn't pick one up. Big, massive stone, okay? Jesus said it's better to have you put that around your neck, throw you into the deepest sea than to do something like that and lead kids astray. And yet that's what's happening in schools around America every single day with lies, okay? Neanderthal man, that's a big one, right? Let's take a look at what's really going on with that. That was the supposed first ape man found back in Darwin's day, okay? Still synonymous with brutishness. Uh, the first Neanderthal remains were found back in 1856 in the Neander Valley, hence Neanderthal, uh, by a school teacher. She kind of looks like a Neanderthal, but let's move on. Uh, now, here's all that they found. This is it, okay? They discovered a skull cap, not the whole skull, but just a skull cap piece of it, and a few other bones, okay? In 1908, this Professor Boulet of the Institute of Human Paleontology in Paris declared that Neanderthal was an ignorant, knuckle-dragging, uh, ape-like man, right? And that's where we kind of get the term. It's still kind of stuck today. And he said this because of his low eyebrow ridges and his stooped-over posture, right? So it's a Neanderthal, right? Well, let's take a look at the facts. Upon closer examination, it's been discovered now, and we've known this for quite some time, and they've known it too, Neanderthal man was just as human as you and I. Had nothing to do with apes. Listen to this. His stooped over appearance was because of arthritis and rickets, which is a vitamin D deficiency. And the Neanderthal skeleton they found was bent over not because he was slowly evolving coming up. He was an old man with arthritis hunching over going down. Now, I'm not going to look at anybody, but I'm sure that some people came in here. And according to evolution, you were evolving. No, it's called getting older and your body starts to go down like that, right? But it had nothing to do with an ape. That's what the facts were. In fact, uh, this expert, Rudolf Virchow, declared, quote, the curved leg bones uh, that they found were the result of rickets of vitamin deficiency. Do people get uh, bow-legged today? Hello, what's that? That has nothing to do with evolution. And the knots of the bone above the eyes have been caused uh, by damage to the skull. Okay, is all it was. And as far as the low eyebrow ridges and long sloping forehead, well, surely that came from an ape. Well, number one, stop calling me Shirley. Number two, that's not true. We see in the same feature in people here still alive today. This is a picture of a Malaysian native with the same skull characteristics. People alive today in certain parts of the world, that's the same skull characteristic. It has nothing to do with an ape. How many guys would say it's probably not a good thing to go up to that guy and say, hey, you came from an ape? How many guys would say it'd be the last time he said that? Okay, but folks, that, that has nothing, that proves nothing. Furthermore, the so-called culture, as they looked around the other area, it has nothing to do with it. Remember the guy said knuckle-dragging ape-like man? Ooh. What they found is in their culture, they were skilled hunters, believed in the afterlife, and they even were surgeons. That's far from knuckle-dragging. Okay, that's the facts of Neanderthal man. Neanderthal man is still in textbooks right now, even though it was proven wrong over now 50 years ago. If all you have is lies to support your theory, maybe it's time to get a new theory. Why would you deliberately lie to people unless you had an agenda? Let's take a look at Java Man. Java Man was uh, another one of the first alleged ape man ever found and, of course, used by evolutionists. And we all know that's where Starbucks evolved from. It was Java Man. 
Wrong one, Jim. Nice try, though. Okay. Uh, he was found on the island of Jaffa and uh, reported to be, that's right, another, another missing link between ape and man. Uh, he was discovered by this guy, uh, Eugene Dubois, in 1891. And all that was found, this is it, it's all I find. Never complete structures. He found a skull cap, a piece of a skull, three teeth, and throwing a femur. That's it. Okay. In fact, the femur was found 50 feet away from the original skull cap a full year later. I hate to get hit by a car. You know what I'm saying? You, push, yeah. you give me a break. And then after serious study, it was discovered that two other pieces of Java man, listen to this, were taken from two different skulls. It's not even the same head. And from two different areas of the island. The dude's just walking around. Oh, yeah, these all must be from the same creature. You got to be kidding me. Now, apparently he had a conscience because he later admitted it was a bunch of baloney. Okay? Later, he went on record and he admitted uh, the original discovery. He rejected its authenticity and admitted that his fossil findings were the mixing together of human skull remnants and the femoral bone of a giant gibbon. So just like the other guy, Piltdown Man, these guys faked it too. Shocker. Anybody starting to see a pattern here? Yeah, okay, let's, let's continue on. How about the uh, Peking man? Obviously, he was found in a cave in Peking, China. You're catching on, Joey. Uh, during the early part of last century. However, no other scientists have directly observed the original site, and it's not actually been seen in more than 50 years. So we're just kind of taking their word for it. But whatever, still got some problems with him. In fact, the only skulls of the Peking man uh, were found uh, as, uh, as well as a few human-like tools. Okay, but never a lower skeleton. So again, they just built it off a few pieces. Again, we haven't been to the actual site, but we're just taking their word for it, but just the pieces of skull. But we did find some human-like tools, okay, but nothing else. Now, what's interesting is that all the examples of Peking man had the back of their skulls smashed in. Hmm, that's weird. Let's take a look. Which exactly matched, isn't that the coolest graphic? I couldn't wait to show that. It's like brain gravy or something. Isn't that neat? You guys hungry now? Yeah, whatever. Uh, but it exactly matched the results of when people of that region, still today, hunt for and eat monkey brains. Okay, it sounds gross to you and I, but if you do your research, monkey meat is very tough, difficult to eat, obviously, but monkey brains still today are considered a delicacy. You can see a picture one there, dead, uh, obviously, uh, as a delicacy for these natives. They like eating monkey brains. Gross to us, but that's what they do over there, okay? As it turns out, Peking man represents not man's ancestor, but man's meal. And the tools they found were the ones used to bash in the skulls to eat the brains of the monkey. That's it. And you know it had to be human. You really honestly think that the monkeys were sitting around some Saturday afternoon? Hey, Bob, what do you want to do? I don't know, Earl, what do you want to do? Hey, let's grab rocks and beat our brains in. <laughs> oh. It's ridiculous. And that's your proof? It's absolutely amazing. How about Ramapithus uh, a kiss, if you can say it, if I can say it. For 20 years, this guy, we'll just call him Rama, uh, was considered one of man's ancient ancestors. And uh, again, on the basis of find something complete, no. They found some teeth and some jaw remnants. That's it, all right? But they got good imagination. He was included in millions of textbooks. He was even in Time Life volumes on human evolution for proof, right? In fact, a detailed uh, reconstruction of his whole body walking upright was constructed, mind you, only from jaws and teeth. Again, you got to be pretty good at that, but they're pretty good at that. They get paid a lot of money for this, apparently. And if that wasn't bad enough, fossil findings in Turkey in 1980 and Pakistan in 1982 proved that Ramapithecus represented extinct kind of monkeys that closely resembled the orangutan. That's it. Had nothing to do uh, with mankind. Orse man. That's right. And uh, this creature was found in a Spanish town called... Orse, Joey, you're... Man, you're, I don't have, I'm going to have more gum, so... Anyway, he was hailed the oldest fossilized human remains ever found in Europe. Man, this has got to be an exciting find, okay? In fact, these scientists said the skull belonged to, listen to this, 17-year-old man who lived 900,000 to 1.6 million years ago. That's a pretty good spread, but whatever. So, and they even made a very detailed drawing of what this guy would have looked like. As you can see, the proof right there. Well, check it out. One year later, they admitted that the skull fragment wasn't even human. It was from a four-month-old donkey. There's your horse, man. <laughs> Can you believe that? And that's your proof? It's nuts, okay? A couple more here, and we'll close. Lucy. 
Got to deal with this. We've talked about this before, but let's deal with it again. Okay, Lucy is one of the biggest finds universally accepted as mankind's supposed ancestor. She was discovered in 1974 in Dar Valley, Ethiopia. That's a reconstruction supposedly of her, right? Bunch of baloney. By this guy, Donald Johansson. Now, he named it Lucy after the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, LSD. Gives you a clue whatever and as the story goes i hear he was this close to running out of time for grant money and all of a sudden hey look what i found but anyway let's still with deal with the facts however when the bones were studied by a spectrograph okay they actually matched a chimpanzee rather than a man oops okay but that's the tip of the iceberg uh, what scatter bones they did find were assembled from totally different locations just like the other example except this was way further than 50 feet the knee joint he found that he said was Lucy was a mile and a half away from the rest of the skeleton and was labeled in National Geographic as Lucy's knee. As one guy said, how fast was that train going when it hit that monkey? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. All right. But Donald never corrected them. Okay. And then he said he thought, well, Lucy was becoming a human due to the fact that an ape has a straight femur and their leg. Okay. But Lucy's knee was angled to the side like a human's, okay, which is true. Although monkeys that walk on ground do have a straight femur, monkeys that climb in trees have what? Angle femur, whoop de doo dah So all this showed is that she was a tree-climbing monkey as opposed to one that walked on the ground. Had nothing to do with humans. And if that wasn't bad enough, the St. Louis Zoo put up a display of Lucy with human feet on her, and guess how many foot bones they found? None. Pure propaganda. That's the actual photo. They made her on purpose with their imagination to look just like a human. That's their best evidence. As it turns out, Lucy is a tree climbing monkey. Some feel there's still some alive today in Sumatra down near Vietnam. It has nothing to do with man, okay? A couple more and we're gonna end. Rhodesia man, this is hilarious. Rhodesia man was found in what is now called Zimbabwe. It was considered to be uh, the first early human fossil found in Africa. Well, wait a second, I, I have to share this with you. This is your tea. This is your teeth on chicken. You knew I had to say it, right? I couldn't pass that up. All right, but anyway, I digress. Let's move on. A paleontologist discovered this uh, Rhodesia man, okay? And, but they said, wait a second, something's weird here. You, you brought us to us, you say this is a missing link, uh, but we look at the thing and it's, it's got tooth decay. Remember, this is supposed to be way back. And, and so they were having a hard time understanding, how could this disease of modern civilization have attacked this supposed prehistoric man. They didn't have Snickers back then. Okay, what? So that, that was the first clue something weird's going on. The second problem was, if that wasn't bad enough, two very odd holes were found in the side of the skull, one over here, one over here, and it caused experts uh, even greater problems. As it turns out, Professor Mayor Berlin said they look like the entry and exit holes of a modern day bullet. Okay, and what happened, folks, was it was actually the remains of a female gorilla. Somebody shot it in the head bullet came out here that's it can you believe that absolutely crazy but the latest one and we'll uh, finish up with this one is called to my man have you heard of that that's you know all you know this has been exposed but no we found another one you keep digging we found another one it's called to my man and uh, let's take a look at that one in 2001 a fossil skull found in chad electrified the world's scientific community Nicknamed Tumai, this creature supposedly lived when the human and chimp lineages allegedly split, making it the oldest human ancestor ever found. The leader of the team that made the discovery confessed, It's a lot of emotion to have in my hand the beginning of the human lineage. I have been looking for this for so long, I knew I would one day find it, so it's a large part of my life. But not all scientists accept this conclusion. For instance, Dr. Bridget Sennett of the Natural History Museum in Paris dismissed the skull as a mere female gorilla. With such conflicting opinions about the same skull, it does make you wonder. Perhaps the skull's discoverer let his emotion and desire for discovery obscure his interpretation of the evidence. No, they wouldn't do that, would they? Yeah, that's what every example of what they would do, okay, and then what they have done, okay? But how many guys would say when you take a look at the evidence, somebody really is trying to make a monkey out of us, right? And how many guys would say you'd have to be a Neanderthal to believe them? 
okay, based on the evidence, okay? But so much so, folks, that uh, these things just keep spreading, man. They keep coming up with all these supposed evidences, you know. Uh, but that's right, with my keen scientific eye, I was able to discover that one of the latest evidences that they have said, oh, no, we have actual photographic proof of a real-life ape turning into a real-life man. Okay, let's take a look at it. Don't be fooled, but let's deal with the facts. You tell me if this proves evolution. Let's take a look at these photographs, okay? Ape turning into a man. Let's take a look, okay? Here's the first photograph. Let's see if we can, we can make this happen here. Oh, no! Wow! I guess they won. I guess there is proof for evolution, Tom. I tell you. Now, hey, I know it's so tempting, and not to get political, uh, but believe it or not, that is just former President Bill Clinton, and those photos were doctored. Okay, don't be deceived. Okay, uh, but seriously, folks, if you think that was funny, believe it or not, it's so bankrupt, this whole missing link thing, even the evolutionists in their own camp admit it, that they want so bad to find this missing link that they make anything a missing link, okay? This is from their own camp, by the way, okay? This is from an anthropologist, Dr. Tim White. Here's what he said. He says, the problem with a lot of anthropologists is they want so much to find a hominid that any scrap of bone becomes a hominid bone. And that's exactly what we saw, right? Okay, T.L. Moore, he said this, the more one studies paleontology, the more certain one becomes that evolution is based on what? Faith alone. Wait a second, I thought we weren't supposed to have religion in schools. Which really doesn't mean that. It really means just get Christianity out. Because they teach witchcraft and new age and about every other religion on the sun except for Christianity. Uh, anthropologist uh, E.A. Hooten said this, from a Neanderthal skull, listen, an artist can fashion the features of a chimpanzee or a what? Philosopher, you can make it look like anything you want. And that it is, quote, not wise uh, to put your faith in the reconstructions. This is their own camp, saying uh, it's a bunch of baloney. Lord Zuckerman, he's a British anatomist. He said this, if man evolved from an ape-like creature, there is not even a trace of such evidence in the fossil record. Excuse me? So why do you keep it in the textbooks? And Miles L. Elrich, listen, this is a big guy. He said, quote, we paleontologists have said that the history of life supports the story of gradual adaptive change, all the while really knowing that it what? It does not. So why do you do it? Because that's the best you got. You got a theory that's completely bankrupt, okay? And it doesn't even hold up. So your best evidence is stories made up. I'll translate that for you. Lies. I've said it before, but I like the one tactic, the one guy. He says, hey, listen, I'm not even advocating. I don't think it'd be a bad thing. I'm not even advocating getting the Bible back into schools. I'm not even advocating uh, getting prayer back into schools. Again, I don't think that's a bad thing. He says, all I'm advocating, could you please take out the known lies that are being taught to the kids in school? And you know why they don't want to get rid of the known lies? Because if you get rid of the lies, and they've actually said this, well, what are we going to have to prove evolution? This is how bankrupt it is, folks. And this is what gets me, is when you see the church today trying to meld the two together. What? And it's that bankrupt. It's absolutely crazy, okay? And in fact, folks, uh, believe it or not, um, Martin Luther warned us. The great reformer, you guys heard of him? Great reformer. He warned us centuries ago what would happen when you took God out of our education. Listen to what he said. We should have listened to him a long time ago. He said, I am much afraid that schools will prove to be the great gates of hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the scriptures, you know, like we used to in our country. Engraving them in the hearts of youth, I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution in which men are not increasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. Man, it's almost like he was a prophet or something. How many of you guys would say the reason why we're seeing such moral decay, the reason why we we're seeing so people so flippantly take lives, the reason why we're seeing such ungodliness is because we didn't listen to him. And our school and our society has been turned into, to use his words, the gates of hell. What you believe determines how you behave. Why are we so shocked when our world has become so ungodly when you lie? 
to kids and tell them there is no God. Okay? But you might be thinking, okay, well, that's the ape man thing, the missing link. And so obviously there's no proof that we evolved from an ape. Okay? Uh, it's a bunch of baloney. But what about the evolution of animals, period? I mean, don't, doesn't evolution say, oh, no, we got proof. We got, you know, mutations, vestigial organs, natural selection, all that stuff. We know that life has evolved. What about all that stuff? Well, Mickey, thanks for asking. Lord willing, we'll have to get to that next week. Let's go ahead and let's pray. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries. And I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven. And that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay, how many of you have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay, well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief, okay? The Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word? Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy. Okay? And folks, let's be honest. We've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pulled the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that, and it's just as bad. He knows the mind. He knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God. And you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn. We, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it. And a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. 
uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, uh, it, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it, if he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that? right now well this has been pastor billy crone of sunrise baptist church and and get a life ministries and if there's anything that we can do for you uh please don't hesitate uh to contact us uh our number our information will uh come up here on the screen shortly and uh, uh if there's anything we could do for you please don't hesitate to let us know uh thank you for uh joining us and uh remember i hope to see you in heaven god bless Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.